Good morning, everybody. Hope everyone's doing well here in Philadelphia. It's a gorgeous day. Too nice to be inside, and especially since we're expecting rain this weekend, but it's really nice not to see any snow uh, anymore. So I hope all of you are doing well, especially for those of you who are living in the Houston uh, area and parts of Texas that were so hit hard hit by the storms. I know it's been incredibly tough for your families, your businesses, your employees, everyone down there. So I hope everything is uh, starting to return uh, to normal. So today we have some great questions. So let's start off with Gable, Gaber Razor. And Gable asks, uh, how can I determine if it's worth selling other people's products to my audience as opposed to selling my own products exclusively? Our company, Rubicon, is Hungary's fastest growing magazine and the number one source of history for Hungarians. We are well known and a trusted brand nationwide, and we've grown a large Shopify store currently selling our subscriptions, past issues of our magazines, and online courses. The idea has crossed my mind that we could become a national retailer of history books by adding historical titles of other publishers to our online store. The company we've partnered with to handle our shipping could easily handle the added inventory and shipping. We would not need to pay for inventory of these books either. The norm in Hungary is to pay monthly or quarterly based on the sales you've made to the publisher. The industry standard commission for book sales is 50%, so that's what we'd make on each sale. This could be a great way to sell more to our existing audience, but at the same time, I worry we'd be cannibalizing our sales of our magazine where we keep 100% of the revenue. Since these books fulfill the same consumer desire, deeper understanding of Hungarian history, how would you uh, decide whether or not to expand in this direction? So if I were you, I would look at the growth trends of your magazine. Is it growing month by month? Are you getting adding on more subscribers or the amounts of money that you're making in this particular uh, in your magazine uh, worth more than you would be making selling books? And is really somebody going to not buy your magazine and only buy the books? Or would people buy both the magazine because you have many more articles as opposed to a book that's focused on one specific topic? Uh, if I were you, I would test this cross-selling out for six months and see if it works. You could even do it as little as, little as three months and see if that works. But you have to give it some period of time and see if the revenue is worth it and see if it is actually hurting your magazine sales. In some cases, it might even enhance your magazine sales and you might be pivoting your business where you are uh, focusing on everything regarding Hungarian history, not just your magazine. So you might be selling across um, T-shirts, memorabilia, all types of things re uh, related to Hungary. So this might open up whole new opportunities for you. So if I were you, I would take the chance, do it for a few months, see what the results are, and then decide if it makes sense to go forward. So I think this could be a great opportunity for you. The next question is from Dylan Burns. Uh, Dylan asks, is hiring seasonal part-time coaches, team members, as a 1099 employee is my best option? Here's what the business is. Anchor Kids organization partners with local schools and districts to provide programming based on the five pillars of health for kids. We have reached a volume that puts us in a place to hire out in order to handle all the schools we're partnered with during the after school hours of three to six. I'm wondering if hiring these seasonal based on school cycles, part-time coaches, team members as 1099 employees is my best option. Long-term goal would be to bring on the ones that perform as full-time W-2 employees and give them the opportunity to work with us during our week-long summer camps our biggest events of the year during the month of July. Um, our pitch is we reverse the trends of poor health and childhood obesity with America's youth and with the five pillars of health for kids. Okay, so if I were you, what I would do here is I would go and um, definitely 1099 people because if you go and take these people on full time, 
Then you're talking about health care benefits. You might be talking about offering retirement benefits. If, in fact, you let those people go, depending on what state you're in, then there's also additional issues that you have to worry about there. So I like the idea of 1099 people. And if you get enough business and you need to add people on, now you've tested those people and see who would best fit. And then there's also people who are going to be coming to you and saying, I would love to work full time for you. Are there more hours that I could take? And now maybe you have a critical mass of employees that you can have, not just for your summer camp all year round. And by the way, maybe you can extend this business and increase it to working with corporations and some other things. So I think it's kind of like the start for you and a good experiment to see how this would go. But more importantly, 1099ing employees means you're only paying them what they actually earn while they're with you and you don't have all of the other things that you have to pay for, especially if in fact you have to let people go um, during a time like we have with the pandemic. I know the pandemic must have been very hard on you uh, and, and the work because I'm sure your folks like to be on site working with people and not just through Zoom. So see how that goes, 1099 them. That's uh, more a cash efficient way uh, of doing it and certainly protects you. And, uh, and then you'll see who works out best and you can go and employ them, especially if the business keeps growing, then you'll have that stable number of full-time excited uh, people who will be working with your clients. This question is asked by Brad Coleman. Brad asks, why are some things I can do to create excitement on a line of apparel about to be released? Any out-of-the-box type ideas or how did you let your audience know it's coming? Here's the description. Hello, I own Carbon Thread Designs, an automotive apparel lifestyle brand, and I'm releasing a new line of apparel over the next month. What are some of the things I can do to let my audience know it will be available for purchase soon? Create Excitement, Exposure, Incorporated. So what you should do is go to your existing customers and do a, uh, a contest for them to come up with the best way for you to market this product. Get their ideas, engage your customers, and then the winner gets some of the new clothing and then they can model that new clothing and they can post it. Or you can go and choose the uh, customers who have the biggest following and you can have them wear the clothing and post it on their, on their websites and different types of social media and have them market it for you. So that way you can grow. You can also go and mention on LinkedIn to, group, uh, to user groups on LinkedIn and to uh, meetup groups who are made up of your target market and mention to them about your new product and give a big discount for the first hundred buyers. Something that's going to go and stimulate people to come to your website and look at it. You can also ask them to enter a drawing and for every time they buy a piece of clothing from you, they get that many more shots to be in your drawing. So that would be another opportunity uh, for you. You can also tell people that you're going to send out a broadcast email and they can look for, uh, find on your site, a code that would go and give them a discount or that they could get the winning code and get fully outfitted in clothing from you, or they can get some past clothing from you. So anything that will get people to wear it, show it, and push the information out would be your best option. The next question comes from Michelle Adams. Michelle asks, what are the considerations for switching an hour employee to a salaried employee? I own a food business and labor is one of our biggest expenses. I have an English bulldog. You can hear her barking. Roxy, come on. She, I think she wants to give advice uh, to you about what she's looking, what she suggests that you do. Let me give her some food quickly. I know all of you are working from home, kid, and Relate to this, so I'm going to give her a quick snack.
well, I am back. So let's go back uh, with the question that we're currently working on now, which is what are the considerations for switching an hourly employee to a salaried employee? Our uh, questionnaire is Michelle Adams, and she asked, I own a food business and labor is one of the biggest expenses. So I'm looking for ways to control labor cost. Need something special to celebrate on an occasion or to stay connected with family and friends and employees, send dessert. I own the Sugar Path and we specialize in helping you stay connected for all your special moments. Our cake jars come in over a dozen flavors and we bake fresh with natural ingredients, package beautifully and ship quickly. Celebrate a birthday, hold a virtual party or turn every meeting into a celebration when you ship a cake. I, I would like to get one of your cakes. I love cake, especially um, chocolate icing with vanilla cake. That would be delicious for me. So I'd love to try your stuff. So I think you're always better off going with hourly employees because that way you can decide how many hours they work. You can make sure that they stay under a certain number of hours so they don't become full-time employees if you can't afford the full-time employees. If you can afford to put them on full-time, that may make it even better for you because you know that they're locked in as employees. They're not going to go and tell you at the last minute. They can't make it to work. They're not going to be looking for another job. And some people, though, by the way, just want to work uh, part time. There are people who are still in school that all they can do is part time. There are people who are retired. They don't want to work full time for anybody. So I like the idea of just keeping people on an hourly wage until you realize that your business has grown so much you need them to be there full time and you're more than willing uh, to go and pay all the additional taxes that come along with it and that you also realize uh, that there are going to be benefits involved and if you decide to let them go depending on what state or even country you're in then you have to consult with a lawyer and understand the laws of your particular community so our next question is from uh, Rowett Gupta. Uh, Rowett asked, I have a business idea and done some research. Now I'm not sure which direction to go. I'm thinking of designing the glove as I have done research to cover the basics, but not sure if this, this, if this is the next step. So the glove, I don't know what type of glove that you're talking about, but I'll tell you this, if it's a glove to wear when you're out in very cold weather, when you're riding your bike or you're skiing, sign me up for that glove because every glove i've ever bought in terms of keeping my hands warm i haven't found anything that keeps those digits those fingers uh warm but that being said what i would do if i was researching is deciding what kind of glove it is and who would be the user of that glove is it somebody who's skiing and they're bike riding are they uh, going and working uh, in the woods and chopping down trees? What exactly are they going to be using your glove for? And then I would find people who, are, who would use those type of gloves and ask them a series of questions about what type of gloves they're looking for. Are they happy with the existing gloves? Is there some way to improve uh, the gloves that they're already wearing? And then I would go and create a model of it, a, de a demo, and then show people what that is and then ask them what do they think of it and what they buy it and then start taking a look at pricing based on what kind of product is it a high end because there are winter gloves that i could go and buy that are 125 dollars i don't want to spend 125 dollars so you have to know who your market is for this product are these people that would use this glove every day because like i'm riding a bike in cold weather 45 minutes to an hour but I'm not out there for hours on end riding a long ride like my one of my best friends who rides on the weekends 25 to 50 miles. So he's riding three to five hours out in really cold weather. Or he might be going skiing out in the West and, and be out there for five, six hours skiing. So again, you have to understand who the market is, what you're trying to accomplish, who are the competitors out there. And is this really a problem that needs solving? Is there these gloves, are they actually going needed? And can you really make a vast improvement over what's currently out there already? The next question is from Christopher Joseph. Christopher asked, 
Is a pre-launch strategy recommended for a software product still in development? And do you have any tips, resources to better learn how to create a proper pre-launch strategy? I'm currently in alpha testing for a small group of target customers for my software tool for content creators and streamers. I was recommended by my CTO to do a pre-launch to build hype, continues to ga continue gauging interest and expand our email list. She says we could do this pre-launch before the product is finalized. We're thinking along the lines of coming soon, landing page when then enter your email to stay in the know. I would like to know your thoughts on how and when we pre-launch strategy should be executed. Thank you in advance. You know, there's really two schools of thought here about that. Some people say this is great because people see it's coming. You can line up buyers. You can even see if there's enough interest by uh, putting this page out there and ask and put the email and if you know what the pricing is going to be. And if you find out there's not really much of a market for it or you have to go and pivot your product, then you can do that too. So there's a lot to be said about that. On the flip side of this are the people want to buy that product right away. And if they can't buy that product, then they go and buy a competitive product for it and they don't come back. Or they're disappointed that you're not ready yet for the product and they feel like they've wasted their time. I don't know that there's a correct answer here, but that being said, I think when you're ready for them to actually test a product, that would be the best time to go and do it. I myself, I'm coming out with a, uh, I've come out with a new product in the financial services area called Funding Organizer, and we are now testing this common application to apply for commercial bank loans. And we've brought in 10 institutions so our so companies have 10 institutions to pick from and now we're going to start marketing to uh, accounting firms and other folks to go and get their clients to apply for commercial loans using our system i don't think i would have um, put up a coming soon page because people will say coming soon i read about it but until i can actually touch it feel it use it what does it really mean to me and and I don't know. I don't know if I want to go and give my email to you and then have you contact me. What are you going to be doing with my email? Maybe you're just a person who collects emails and then sells off our information to other people. So myself, it's, if it's me, what I would do is I would wait until you're ready to go and beta test this product and then put information up on your website, letting people know your beta test that they can test it for free and then you're going to start seeing people who want to go be first uh, users of your particular type of product and the faster the people can come on like the alphas if you can get quotes from them about how good this product is and they should try it that's going to help you tremendously so i hope i helped you out there the next question is from bob uh, gagir uh, bob asked do I use one LLC for everything or separate LLCs for different products and services? I'm about to launch my company and I need to file my LLC. However, I anticipate I will have at least one or two other unrelated products and companies that I will test this year. Should I file an LLC up? Should I file as a parent LLC? And what point is the business development cycle should LLC be filed? First of all, I would file an LLC as soon as you're ready to sell uh, to the public. And why? Because you want to protect yourself legally. And the only reason I would create different LLCs is if the product really had nothing to do with what you're offering. So as an example, I have Kramer Communications and Marketing Communications business, and that is its own separate business. I have another business called Stress-Free Family Business, and that business does consulting with family businesses. That is a totally separate business, totally separate market, the Kramer Communications, which develops um, business sales, operating and marketing plans. And so I've created a separate LLC for that. But I have point, uh, pitch to me first.com and that's a service where I review business plans and that one is an offshoot of Kramer Communications. So I didn't LLC for that. But I definitely would go with an LLC in the beginning. And if you're looking to get investors, you probably want to go with a C corporation. And before you even do any of those things, you should definitely check with your accountant and find out what the tax ramifications are 
for the state that you're in and uh, for what you're planning to do with it. Because if you're raising outside capital, more than likely your investors are going to want you to incorporate in the state of Delaware because investors have more rights in the state of Delaware. So again, you have to take a look at all these different things about what your plans are, but I definitely would not go out as a sole proprietor, especially your tempting fate that somebody could sue you and that you could lose uh, your personal wealth, maybe even your kid's college education. Again, that depends on how that is structured. If your name is on that, or if it's not on that, that would be a big difference. So those are the things that you have to consider uh, when you are deciding whether you're going to be an LLC. If it's just you, your money, that will probably work. If it's other people's money coming in, well, then you're going to have to check whether it should be a C corporation or something else that will be taking in that capital. And things are always in a state of change because it all depends on whose administration is in. So again, check with your accountant, check with your attorney, and then make that decision. The next question is from Jordan Shaw. Jordan asks, what is the best route for us to increase sales and users? We want to start advertising on YouTube, as we believe that the best return will come from YouTube, but we're also open to other suggestions. If perhaps outbound sales, outbound sales direct to businesses would yield a greater return. Here's the business. Our software just hit the app uh, Sumo marketplace. We wanted to go to market with App Sumo for exposure and feedback. We have used our software for our own business and agency, and we believe it's a good tool for small businesses in general. Any industry with sales or an agent staff is great for is great for our system. We need to figure out the best path to growth and sustain. Our software has been used by marketers in the past, but we want to essentially cut out the marketers and offer a complete marketing solution for businesses. I really wish I understood what your business does in order to give you a better idea. Oh, here is your pitch. I'm the founder of Funbolt, Funnelbolt, an all-in-one marketing SaaS solution for businesses. We help businesses convert leads to sales without complex coding and endless integrations. We built in landing pages and custom forms. Fun, Funnel Bolt allows businesses to communicate with their leads, customers to drive more sales, conversions with text message, ringless voicemail and email marketing automation tools all in one place. Funnel Bolt is free the, for the first 14 days. You might you also become a member of Boost Academy, our members only feed Facebook group, where we give you all the tools and resources you need to start crushing it. I like that crushing it. So you want to know what's the best way uh, for you to increase sales and users. And should you start advertising on YouTube? So again, it all depends on who your target market is. Is it mom and pop businesses? And what industries would actually use your product? Or is it large corporations where you're selling to the head of sales uh, or the head of marketing your particular product? So again, you have to understand who the market is because there are 32 million businesses in the U.S. 28 million of those businesses are a million dollars or less in revenue. So you can see like 80% of the audience are a million dollars or less. So are you selling to those particular folks? And there's obviously in the smaller the business, the shorter the sales cycle. Also, I don't know what the pricing is for your particular product. You know, if you're saying, hey, the pricing is fifty thousand dollars a year. Well, then you're probably looking at going to larger organizations because the small organization couldn't fit that. That being said, possibly you're doing email marketing campaigns uh, and maybe you're going to run ads on Google. So when somebody is looking for this type of product, they see it up on Google. I'm not sure who looks for products on YouTube. I've never thought myself of looking for a specific product on YouTube. I do watch YouTube after I bought a product to see what the instructions are on how to put it together or use it or problem solve any of those kinds of things. But I'm not so sure YouTube is a smart way to go about doing it. Now, that being said, I think it would be good for you to go and survey your existing clients and ask them, 
What do you recommend? What, what would be the best way to market this product to you in order for you to consider it? Pretend like you never heard about us before and ask them if, if uh, what they would do if they were in charge of marketing for you. And I like asking that question by saying to people, if you were in charge of marketing, how would you go and handle this? And, and then you get the best possible answers because when you ask people what's how should they market to you, they just tell you what they think you want to hear. But if you say to them, hey, if you were in charge of marketing, how would you do it? You always get great answers. And the other thing you could do is see what your competitors are doing. How are they advertising this particular type of product out in the marketplace? Are there any of them using YouTube? Uh, or are they using Google, or are they using direct email campaigns, or are they buying lists, or are they doing broadcast fax services to businesses because nobody faxes much anymore, or are they doing uh, mailings and they're doing it by zip code or type of industry, or are you buying ads uh, that are being sent out by newsletters to the specific group that you're after? So there's a lot of different ways that you can go. But I would definitely start out by asking your existing customer base what they advise you to do. Well, it was great speaking to all of you today. I hope you stay safe. I hope you don't mind my English Bulldog, Roxy, who is absolutely gorgeous. Maybe I can show you a quick picture of Roxy here. But this is my English Bulldog, Roxy, and she is a beauty queen. And so anytime she barks, I jump. Uh, what they say about bulldogs, they don't have masters, they have servants, or they have staff, they have staff. So I am staff for Roxy. Well, again, I hope all of you have a great day. I hope all of you that I gave suggestions to have great success. Everybody stay healthy, take care, and please wear your mask until you're able to get at least your shots, but even then you'll probably still need to wear it for the rest of the year. Take care, have a great weekend.